history. I'm interested in the history that made them who they are and how they made history in turn. I use source materials when I can get them, letters, memoirs, contemporary chronicles and so forth, as well as internet references, of course, and any of these or all of them can be absolutely wrong. So if you disagree with anything I say, or you have another point of view or whatever, put it in the chat and at one of the breaks, uh, we can discuss it. Okay, to understand the people involved, we will have to review a little bit of history to break up a boring recitation of sex and violence. There's your trigger warning. Please be patient. We're going to cover um, the history of Florence in about three minutes, um, the varieties of Reformation in another maybe three minutes, and the wars of religion much more extensively in France. Okay, Catherine de' Medici, originally, or Catherine de' Medici, if I try to pronounce French, an originally born Caterina de' Medici, despite the adulatory biography by Balzac, was one of the worst people who ever lived. She would have been Adolf Hitler if she had the technology, and I'm very glad she didn't. She gave birth to three forgettable kings of France, one of whom married Mary, Queen of Scots, and also a bunch of daughters who ended up queens of various places. And one of these was a charming, beautiful, adventurous, a great writer, and a fascinating person. And that's Margot. Dumas wrote a novel about her called Queen Margot, which I absolutely recommend. You can read her memoirs, which she wrote, um, a little, well, not always truthful, but close. And there was a major film from 1994 about her starring Isabella Ciani and Henri Boyle Stendhal uh, drew on her legend for his great novel, The Red and the Black. Okay, so here we go to Florence. And of course, this is the cathedral with Brunelleschi's famous storm. And Medici Florence was an absolute explosion of art, architecture, unparalleled in the history of Europe since the fall of Rome. The Medici were not, own, were not descendants of an aristocratic family. They were bankers, they were very rich bankers, they were patrons of the arts. Um, they sponsored Michelangelo, Cellini, Titian, and a host of other names we all know in reverence. Florence at this time was going through a very difficult period, otherwise known as her history. Um, she had been a republic at least since 1138, with some significant periods of exception, that was governed by a signoria. Um, and the signoria was chosen by lot. They weren't voted for. There was a bag of people who were of good repute. And this included members of the nobility, the major guilds, the, the guilds, by the way, were not labor unions. They were composed of the owners of businesses and the, the people. I think there were property qualifications, but I'm not sure of that. The numbers of representatives fluctuated from time to time. In, and that was the idea. Okay, here we have the Signoria, which is where the Signoria met. In fact, the succession to the government wasn't quite the idea. Uh, the major families fought for inclusion and they tried to exclude the other families because obviously it was a very good thing to be in the government because you got a lot of money for it. Now, way back in the 12th and 13th century, um, 
The Florence had been torn, or torn apart by the rivals of the Guelphs and the Ghibellines. The Guelphs had been for the Pope, and you can remember that because there's a P in Pope, I need these things. And the Gibbs, on the other hand, were for the Holy Roman Emperor. Now that got all settled in 1122, the Concordat of Forum settled it, but the bitterness and occasional violent outbreaks continued unabated in Florence. Each faction was associated with particular families. And as I explained, they would do anything to keep the government. Okay. Um, in 1434, this gentleman, Cosimo de' Medici, um, got to be Gonfalonieri. He was, of course, a banker. And you can see that given the standards of the times, his clothing is very sedate. Um, and he was a very good guy. He was a patron of Michelangelo's works, which we'll see later, and also of Donatello, that's Donatello's Mary Magdalene, and right next to it is a bit of uh, Fra Angelico's uh, crucifixion. The accession of the Medici brought a period of order. Cosimo almost bankrupted the Medici Bank, not the people, with civic projects and sponsorship of artists such as Donatello and Fra Angelico, but the Florentines were very proud of him and his works. Resentment, however, rankled in the rival clans and reached a climax with the murder in the cathedral, not the one by T.S. Eliot, but the Italian version of Easter 1670. 1478, Cosimo's grandson, Lorenzo. Uh, Jane, uh, I apologize. There was a question. Uh, the Cosimo's uh, clothes, uh, he looks like a cardinal. Is there any <laughs> reason for it? I guess red, red was kind of their color back in those days. Like a <laughs> royal, royal color, right? Yeah, royal color. Um, it got a little different, as I'll show, but here's, here's Lorenzo. And again, you see the red, and I think it also had to do with the painting. If you show him in black against a black background, it's not going to do too well. Anyhow, here is Lorenzo. He was later styled the Magnifico, and Magnifico was a, not a title of nobility. It was something that was given to very exceptional commoners. And he attended the services in the cathedral that Easter with his brother Giuliani and Giuliano. And excuse that slip. Um, and a gang of armed men led by the Pazzi and the Real, Real families attacked them. They stabbed Giuliano to death and wounded Lorenzo, who managed to escape. There was a small army of 600 just outside the city gates that was supposed to lead the expected rising of the people in seizing the signoria, um, or the signoria. Uh, isn't that sort of familiar? And instead, the populace literally lynched the murderers. All were killed in various horrible ways. One of the Pazzi heads was used as a door knocker at the family residence. Lorenzo commissioned the first of the Medici family for tombs for Giuliano. Both before and after Lorenzo became Gonfalonieri, he outdid Cosimo in his sponsorship of artists and philosophers, including Michelangelo and Botticelli. And let me get down there. Here is Botticelli's famous Venus. It was pretty much acknowledged by then that the Medici were hereditary lords of Florence, or they were not yet ennobled. Magnifico, as I explained, was a term just given to comedy so far. Not all Medici were created equal. 
Caterina, as she was then called, obviously, was born in 1519 in the Medici Palace. Her father was Lorenzo de' Medici, this guy. Now, you will see there's a real difference in this. Um, look at the ermine collar, look at the outrageously puffed sleeves, look at the dissipated face and not the serious one of the bankers. And this insignificant guy became even less significant when he died within a week of Katerina's birth. Her mother had died already in child. But this is she, Madeleine de la Tour d'Auvergne. Her inheritance included a juicy shape chunk of France, um, which swelled the Medici coffins, coffers. And she was, by the way, a direct descendant of Godfrey of Bouillon, the crusader conqueror of Jerusalem. So indeed, whoever married her and enriched the Medici, one of whom was Pope at the time, would have to be noble. And this is why the Lorenzo that we just showed is also called the Duke of Urbino. And he was also a patron of Michelangelo. And this incredibly beautiful thing is his tomb. And they often say it's the tomb of Lorenzo de Medici, but not the Magnifico. And put that up. And here is the Medici Palace where Caterina was born. Now, what to do with her? She was now an orphan, but you know, Italian families, even back then, or maybe especially back then, I don't know, um, were very big and they also, they cared for their own people. So at the next person Medici in line was Piero and his wife was Alfonsina, who we have here. Um, Piero, I don't, I don't need to um, tell you too much about, except he was called by the Italians, Piero il Fatuo, which means fatuous. And he was called later in the history books, Piero the Unfortunate, and he got himself exiled uh, for a rather craven transference of several Florentine fortresses to the invading army of Charles of France. All Medici males were exiled at the time, but women were allowed to stay. Their funds were limited. They could only spend their money in their dowries. And so Alfonsina herself died a few months later. So we had another transfer of Katerina, and she had now lost all of the most important people in her life. So she went on to Alfonsina's daughter, Clarice, who was married to, into the Strozzi family. Clarice had 10 children, although they weren't all born then, and a lot of household help, but it was very easy for the new arrival to get lost in the crowd. By the way, Alfonsina was an amazing woman. Uh, she was very active in Florentine politics and she even took over the government um, from time to time when the men were either exiled or on the battlefield. Okay, history goes on. We now have this gentleman who every, everybody recognizes, Savonarola. Um, he got himself excommunicating for dissing the Pope and burned by the Florentines who very kindly hanged him the following before he was executed. Life had not been good in Florence. After Charles's invasion, there was famine and plague. If you claim to be the mouthpiece of the word of God, it does not go well if the word doesn't lead to good things in a timely fashion especially if the Pope is your enemy. But Savonarola was absolutely fascinating. The first picture I showed was contemporary. This came a couple of centuries later, but it gives a wonderful idea what he was as a preacher. 
Okay, he was succeeded by an actual republic. And that finally, in 1512, by Cardinal Giovanni Medici at the head of troops belonging to Pope Julius II. By the way, also Julius was the one who broke the temporal power of the Borgias in person on the battlefield, rebuilt St. Peter's and left the paper treasury full after the Borgia popes had emptied it. Um, and that factor we will get to very shortly. It wasn't the great thing that it might have been. Cardinal Giovanni got promoted to shepherd of the world himself, Pope Leo X in the following year. Okay, and we're going to do so fast. And there's Pope Leo, and we will follow him with Clement, who is much more important. Ten years later, a second Medici Pope was elected and took the name Clement VII. He installed two flagrantly bad behaving by low brothers, try saying that best, Ippolito and Alessandro. Here. By the way, just wanted to mention that he is the son of that uh, killed Medici during the Pazzi revolt. Uh, Which one uh, are you talking about? The Clement the Seventh. He is the oh, son Clement of uh, uh, Giulio uh, Medici, um, who you... was who was killed uh, in that uh, in a in a uh, during the Pazzi uprising. Oh, the Pazzi Pazzi yeah. uprising. Yes. Um, by the way, I believe that the uh, game I played as a kid, Pazzi, uh, actually comes from the. Uh, from the name Pazzi, which was dishonored later in Florence. Uh, Brooklyn, where I grew up with, had a lot of Italians. Okay. And, okay. And now actually, Alessandro, this guy, was ascribed to um, Katerina's father because they didn't want him ascribed to the Pope for obvious reasons. And now they were in charge. Their actual father, the Pope was doing a superb imitation of a tennis ball in the struggle between Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor and Francois Premier of France. And this went on until 1527 when the emperor's troops sacked Rome, the Pope escaped in disguise as a beggar and Florence rose against Alessandro. Caterina got herself sent to a convent for safekeeping. And she was actually happy among the nuns, possibly for the first time in her life Outside, the Florentines were screaming for her to be hung out on the city walls as target practice for the interior, imperial troops. But the nuns didn't tell her that. Alessandro returned to Florence, but his behavior did not improve. And he was assassinated within a year and succeeded by a more acceptable Medici from another branch of the family. Little Caterina grieved for him because she had a childhood crush on him while Clement made arrangements for her marriage. I mean, she was almost 13 by now, what do you think? And here we finally get to a picture of her, not the one you first saw. And here is her first, here's her spouse to be, Henri II, Deuxième of France. Now, perhaps this early history explains Catherine's lifelong lack of empathy for anyone but the man she married. She learned that those who seem to love you disappear or disappoint. Her husband, by the way, confirmed her, and not by the way, we'll get into that, 
in all sorts of ways, but adrift from all else, she clung to him like a limpet, despite his proved indifference to her. From her birth in 1519, by the way, he, he was born the same year, until his, her first pregnancy in 1544, she had learned that her only refuge was the shelter of the Catholic Church. Unfortunately, Henri II had an early life as shunted and disordered and maybe worse than hers. And emotionally, he was just like her, both born just a few days before her. He lost his mother when he was eight years old and old enough to really feel it. A year later, his father, Francois I, Francis I, fought the Battle of Pavia against all advice and predictably lost it and was taken captive. And of course he had to get back and rule France. So what did he do? He sent Henri, age eight, I believe, and his sister and his older brother, the Dauphin, as substitute hostages in Spain. They were treated very graciously at first because they were cute kids and they were expecting money for them in castle rooms with tapestries on the walls to guard against the drafts. But later on, as the money wasn't paid, their quarters got worse and worse and finally degenerated into a prison cell with barred windows and bare stone walls well before the boys were returned. And they experienced four years of this captivity and repeatedly dashed hopes of rescue. You can imagine the disillusion with their father, who anyway, been for, far too busy on the battlefield with his mistresses to pay much attention to them in their early years. He seems to have forgotten them completely in their captivity. Their younger brother, the court pet was still in France, so who needed them? Francois's mother, the grandmother of the kids, Louise of Savoy, was the one who sent an envoy to Spain and learned of the appalling condition of her grandkids. Louise negotiated with her childhood friend, Archduchess Margaret of Austria, now governor of the Spanish Netherlands, and the peace of the ladies or the Treaty of Cambrai brought full peace. Back home, Louise basically started a GoFundMe to bring the children back. The bourgeoisie and the clergy contributed and the king and nobles, not so much. Only a few years after their return, Henri's brother and sole captivity and in his captivity died after a tennis game and Henri became Dauphin. I rest my case. In 1531, when Pope Clement declared the bidding open on Catalina, Henri's chance of the throne was slight. Catalina did not lack for suitors, including James V of Scotland, but Francois was very anxious not to lose Catalina's French possessions uh, through her mother. France had learned that lesson when Eleanor of Aquitaine remarried abroad. And so he made his offer most agreeable. And we will continue. Here we have Francois himself, the not so nice guy. Here we have Louise of Savoy and Margaret of Austria. And here we have the wedding and the Pope presiding. Well, actually a Cardinal presiding, but far and away the Pope. They had, you know, a real dream wedding. This picture, by the way, is by Vasari, um, who's mostly known for his architectural um, art. They had wine fountains in the streets, tournaments, et cetera, et cetera. And apparently a very satisfying night as well. 
as is customary, it was written by, witnessed by the father of the groom, who remarked that they just well. However, there's always a however, right? There would not be a lot of jousting with Catherine to follow. Henri had always been friends with a somewhat older woman, but now that he was initiated, the friendship turned sexual. Diane de Poitiers, born in 1500, and that is 19 years before him, was a woman of, as the phrase goes, goes uh, much experience. And no doubt a more interesting jousting repertory than his teenage, up till now, virgin wife. And the ambiguous monogram appeared all over the castle, including over the marital bed. Now, if you look at this, we have an age we have a D and we have a backwards D. Or if you look at another way, we have an H, we have a C and we have a backwards C. And if we look at it the third way, we have an H and we have a D for Diane de Poitiers and we have a C for Catherine. Now, if you'd like to vote, put your hands up for Diane, leave them down for Catherine. My solution is this is for Henri, Diane, and Catherine. Do royals do um, threesomes? When Henri became king, he gave Diane, not one, but two chateaus, Annette and the famous Clemenceau, not to mention a princely pension. None of this endeared him or her to the people who were paying the bills. Of course, Henri had an important job, fathering the succession. He did try, but his heart was elsewhere, and three years went by and there was no pregnancy. Catherine wept at the feet of her father-in-law, offered to be put aside, but Francois was fond of her and told her to keep on trying. The whole nation despised Diane and Franz couldn't afford to let Catherine remarry and take her dowry with her. Catherine II, it is said, even had holes bored in the floor so she could watch her husband at his labors with Diane and learn from her. Finally, some very bright person thought to call a doctor who examined the royal couple, noted a slight physical abnormality and recommended a change in position. She should lie on her back and stay that way for 10 minutes after the main event, which eventually worked beginning in 15, 44, Catherine had 10 pregnancies, almost all of which resulted in live births. In all of this, Henri's flaunted infatuation with Diane, Catherine's period of infertility, did Henri give any indication that he noticed his wife's distress? Far less motivated him to modify his ways Surely the bedroom could have done without those initials that could be read as HD, passive aggressivism, or just let, lack of empathy like hers. Anyhow, here are the children, at least the four of them that became um, royal. And here would be Francis I and um, 
no, this one would be Francis I because she's, no, this one's Francis I. This is probably Francis II. Uh, this one will be Henri uh, III, and this one will be uh, Charles the Ninth. I, th I think Francis Francis was the oldest. Yeah, Francis was the oldest. He certainly was, but he was it the smallest. Looks, oh, okay. <laughs> he was, I, thought, I he assume was a, he is. <laughs> no, no, okay. he was kind of a dwarf. Uh, when he was courting Elizabeth, she called him her little frog. And that's the reason why the British call them the French frogs to this day. But the artist probably put him down here because if he put him up there, he would have really looked dwarfish. This way the small statue is explained. Okay, so there are the kids. There's uh, Chenon So, which was given to Diane. By the way, um, well, I'll get to that in a minute or two. Okay. Um, so we did the kids and, um, yeah, she was happy about that. She was really happy. But then Diane was given precedence in the nursery. She was the one that was supposed to raise the kids. Uh, and this was to her, that was the most painful slight from her husband that she ever endured. But Diane was aging. She was over 60 in 1566, the year of Catherine's final preg pregnancy. For some years, Henri had begun patronizing prostitutes and he now spent more time with her, but she had only a few years to enjoy this phase of their relationship. In a jousting op opponent, failed, that's a real jousting, because he liked that on the bat, well, on the tournament list, um, tournament fields. Um, a jousting opponent failed to drop his lance, which you were supposed to do after you were made contact because you weren't supposed to kill somebody, but his opponent didn't drop his lance. And so a long splinter went into Henri's eye and a few days later killed him rather painfully. Catherine moved very swiftly. The following day, she confronted Diane. She stopped her pension and kicked her out of Chalonceau. She did let Diane keep the smaller Chateau Anne, where she was ultimately entombed until some saint Prudeau in the French Revolution um, dug her up and threw her in what was left of her in a ditch. I, Catherine would have enjoyed that. By the way, she uh, this incredible bridge over here was added by Catherine, who wanted it to look Italian with these kinds of arches. Okay, the king is dead. Long live the king. Francois is here, and there is looking rather less beautiful than she is reputed to be, and certainly cut down to size because she was very tall, which really Pete owed Elizabeth, uh, is uh, Mary, who would be Queen of Scots when her mother died. Now, Mary was the daughter of the current Queen of Scots, who was Mary of Guise. And so we will uh, talk about that. As far as Catherine was concerned, she couldn't be the queen because queens were prohibited in France. She couldn't be regent because uh, Francois was now 15 years old and that was old enough to reign. Um, so she was only like dowager queen, which is kind of um, like on the edge of get out of here. But, um, Francois had his advisors, he was only 15 after all, and one of them was Mary, descendant of the Guises. And we must now talk about the House of Guise. While we were nattering on, there was a reformation happening. Remember, we talked about Pope Julius and how he left the coffers filled after the Borgias had emptied it. And we will now get to how he did this. 
He did this by the sale of indulgences, and we all know about that. They were um, a kind of get out of purgatory card free. And um, what purgatory was, was a penance imposed when the quick of the dead were judged and you were sent to purgatory in case, you know, confession and remorse and the last rites hadn't really cured you. So you were supposed to get rid of all of that. And with a period of purgatory, which was supposed to be rather unpleasant. Well, every, they were first um, sold at, during the Crusades. They were offered to the Crusaders as a total remission of sins. And that was way back in 1095. Gradually, it came to the point where anybody could buy them. Now, poor people didn't have to buy them because poor people were considered, and I think this is really nice, to have lived their purgatory on earth. Of course, nobody did anything about that, but or not much anyway. Uh, but gradually they were offered to anybody who had the ability to pay. Okay, and anyway, the poor didn't have any money. So this ultimately horrified a young and idealistic Augustinian monk with the name of Martin Luther. Not only because he had seen families totally impoverished by their investments in the afterlife, but also on theological grounds. Everybody knows about the 95 theses, which are said to have been posted on the door of the Wittenberg Church, Wittenberg Church, excuse me. Luther had a great sense of the dramatic, but not everybody has read them. So I will quote, quote a couple here. The Pope neither desires nor is able to remit any penalties except those imposed by his own authority or that of the canons. That is, purgatory is imposed by God and the Pope can't gainsay them. Those priests <coughs> act ignorantly and wickedly, who in the case of the dying reserve canonical pe penalties for purgatory. No prince absolutely can't remit it, and either they don't know or they don't care. Those who believe that they can be certain of their salvation because they have indulgence letters will be eternally doomed and damned together with their teachers. Okay, and here is Martin himself looking very determined. And we will slide this down so we can get to um, more relevant people. And that is um, I think it's Calvin, right? Calvin is this one. I'm trying to remember which one is which. This one yeah, is the, the left Fingley. is Calvin. Yeah, okay. that one's Fingley. Okay. Martin Luther did not mince words. He wasn't the only reformer. More pertinent to our tale is the work of Jean Calvin, who is this one. Whoops, come back here. There you are. And Huldrich Zwingli in Switzerland. All three were strong advocates of translating the word of God as they believe into the language of the people who worshiped him. The first effort was actually by the Bishop Vovla in Gothic in the fourth century, but nobody read that language anymore. There was a partial translation from the Vulgate, which is the Latin version into middle high German in the fourth century, but Luther's version into high German from the Greek and Hebrew, which he knew was the most popular. A French Bible came much later. The first one actually printed in the waning years of the 18th, 15th century were assembled from manuscript translations. 
the reformers differed in their views of the Eucharist, which is ingestion of the bread, the body of Christ, the wafer, as it is today, and the wine, which represented his blood. Well, was his blood, if you're Catholic. Was it a miraculous transubstantiation of one to the other, which is the Catholic version, a reminder of Jesus' original sacrifice, which is what Calvo and Zwingli believed, or is the essence of Christ taken into the body with the bread and wine, which was Luther's take. And as you can see, they were very different and actually more blood has been spilled over all of this. Um, but I than ever was spilled on Golgotha. Okay, I would like to play this thing. And uh, Zach, if you can tell me. Just press on it, just go ahead. Just press on it, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. You might wanna expand the screen. No, no sound. Yeah, do you have a headphones on maybe? That's why? Yeah, I think I've got a, a um, here's more. You gotta do more and I'm mute. You're, uh, um... Am I on mute? No, you I'm don't not. have a, your computer. Oh, my computer's on mute? No, that screen that you have on has no sound. So you gotta, you, you might have like a sound across of it. You just need to click on that sound. Do you see it? No, I don't. It's usually in the bottom. But you, you, can you expand the screen to the max? Uh, well, we can see, how do I do that? OK. Um, yeah, right there. Yeah. Right. No, no, no. Yeah, that, that one. Yeah, click on it. OK. Just click on that. Double click, yeah. Oh, no, oh. it's like that. Okay. We know. Is screen click, is click, the click that where the movie is. Uh, the screen yeah. where the movie is, yeah. yeah. Is there something in the bottom there? No, on the, on the right side, no, nothing. We don't see it. Yeah, double click on this, double click on this right there. Okay, Perfect. thank you. Whoever did that, okay. Now, now press the play and make the sound louder. It must be in the bottom. Yeah, that you see sound anywhere? Yeah. It's on Max. Is there any, uh, is it muted by any chance? Do you see there is a sound icon there that, is it crossed? Where is it, Jane? Can you uh, tell me? Maybe I can play it from the YouTube or something. I don't know. Uh, all right. I mean, it, I don't see. Yeah, there's a sound. It should be on the bottom. It should. Yeah, on the bottom. Yeah, you see this? Yeah, oh, I see it. Yeah. It is. Okay, yeah, it's good. Right there. Yeah. Oops. No, no, you muted click, it now. Okay. Click one more time. Wow. And I mean, Right. You still yeah. don't hear it. It's interesting. I'm not sure why. Well, maybe it's a computer. Uh, on your computer, uh, is your sound? Uh, oh, right maybe there. you have to increase on the... Show notification. Just say allow. Can you hear it now? Up there. No, up uh, north. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, up. You see allow, the notification? I don't know. I mean, it's... Uh, it's... I think no, you no, have go left, go left. You see, there is a uh, says allow or block. You uh, can you, allow it. Can you say in your own words what's happening? Maybe that's the way. I mean, I don't know what I, what else to yeah, say. Yeah, I guess it's. Can yeah. you hear it at all? No. Oh, Let's okay. keep it then. Um, well, in that case, we have alternatives. Um, let me get out of this. 
Uh, Amir's saying we should set ourselves for a Zoom setting. I don't know if that's possible. Um, I don't know. How. Sorry, guys. Sorry, technical issues. Technical issues. Um, <laughs> let's see. Now, where is my... I'm on screen sharing, right? So what, what I have yes. to do is close this off. Um, close. Okay. Yep. We do have alternatives. Good. <laughs> but people have to work. Well. All oh. right. All right. Yeah. Well, I like that better. <laughs> Especially if you can read the notes. Yes. Well, I will try to. How many of this know this? This is Old Hundredth. And it is sung in practically every Protestant church in the world. It's by Louis Bourgeois, who is contemporary with what we're talking about. The, um, the other one, A Mighty Fortress is Our King, is the most popular Lutheran hymn in the world. And this one, if you'll just follow along with me, here we go. Everybody unmute. Unmute. Come no, on, I people. Don't, I, don't, I don't think everybody can unmute. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it also a little bit dangerous because we keep everybody muted for a reason. Yes, but bombers... this is one minute. Greg, one minute. Greg, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unmute everybody. I mean, okay. just for go ahead. Let's do that. Okay, here we All go. Right, let's, let's try that. Come in on four. four. One Two, three. Oh, one Praise second. God from whom um, all um, blessings flow. Praise Him um, above um, and here um, below. Praise Him praise above. Yeah. Oops, let me get to the words. <laughs> <laughs> And okay, now let me get back to my slideshow, which I, oh, I know, I know what I have to do. Save the document, down we go. Okay, um, I'm sorry we can't hear this because this is really good. They say down at the bottom here. Well, anyhow, I'd like to give uh, just a little video of the way that this is, the way that this um, looks when people are actually singing what we just did. That won't go. There we go. Hi, I, I can walk you through how to share the sound. So if, if you click on the Zoom icon in the bottom, and then, can you hear me? Jane, can you hear him? Jane, can you hear me? Jane? Uh, so Hi. I'm just going to walk you through how to do it. So click on the uh, Zoom icon on the bottom, he says. See, pause bottom it, right, pause it bottom now. right. Okay. Just leave it paused for a second or just uh, click on the zoom icon in your task bar all the way at the bottom. On the right. Even lower yeah. than where you yeah, are. Yeah, that's lower it. Than... Yeah, yeah, that was it. Uh, no, I was talking about the zoom button. Oh, okay. If you just pause it for a second. Jane, Jane, can you pause it for a second and then click on zoom bottom on the bottom? Hold on. Let me it see might be I... loud on her side. It might be loud on her side. Oh, I see. That's why. Okay, one second. Let me see if I can maybe manipulate it here. Ah, I so got it. You got it. You got it. <laughs> Oh, 
okay. So now <laughs> let's let's see if we can do the other ones. And here we go with Luther's. Make sure I'm pretty sure there's no throwing out of anything that I. <laughs> Okay, they never asked the congregation to sing that last operatic thing. That's, uh, that's by Meyerbeer, this wonderful opera, Le Huguenot. And there is the Huguenot servant of the noble. Um, and it's a very dramatic thing. You will like it. Now, here is from the top 40 of the Catholic churches of the time. generally says everything that needs to be said about the Reformation. You can feel what a great popular uprising it was. Um, and now let's get on to uh, the Guises. The Guises were, of course, Catholic. Uh, the brother of Francis de Guise was the Cardinal of Lorraine. The two of them were immensely powerful. And Francis de Guise was like a rock star at the time. He had saved um, Francois Premier Bacon by winning the Battle of Metz, or rather raising the siege thereof. And that was my place.
He had routed the emperor's troops at a battle that Francois never should have been at. And he bore visible uh, testament to his valor because he was pierced through both cheeks by a lance and got the catchy nickname of Le Balafre, the scarred one. What could be more romantic? Francis of Guise used his influence and in that of his brother, the Cardinal of Lorraine, to successfully push the marriage of um, the teenage king to his niece, Mary. And so it happened, the outrageously beautiful marriage to the outrageously beautiful Mary. After the marriage, it was a case of whatever Mary wanted, Mary got. Catherine, still in shock and grief from Henri's death, bringing it back to that, uh, she was a political neophyte at that time. She didn't remain that. She was firmly just set aside and her supporters scattered. The Guises would tell Mary to tell the besotted Francis what to sign and what not to sign. And they were in, in fact rulers of the nation. And this would have gone on forever, except for one little stumble. And that was Amboise. The yeah. Huguenot, excuse me? Sorry. Uh, the Huguenot hated the Guise, of course, and one adventurer, Le Renault, tried to take things into his own hands by kidnapping the king or attempting to or plotting to at the Chateau d'Amboise, where um, Francis I had made a studio for Leonardo da Vinci, one of his few good points. Francois, that is, Leonardo had many good points. The plot was discovered, the conspirators rounded up by the Guises and Amboise, given kangaroo trials and executed on the spot. This is the way um, it was. And you can see them hanging over here. And is that their heads? No, that's just onlookers but they are all over the place being dead. Here are some heads over here. Um, well, this did not exactly sit well with everybody because um, the court loved it. They would go by candlelight and have processions nearby and look and make fun of the dead people. But just the same, they were a little bit nervous because uh, a lot of these people were, in fact, ennobled. And you're not supposed to do that to ennobled people. It's not supposed to happen. And it stiffened the opposition to the Guises and coming from people that counted. Even one of Catherine's sons was flirting with Calvinism, and another was good friends with the prominent Huguenot. Might they be at risk of this someday? Oops. Okay. And by the way, here is a picture of where the Valois hung out when they were at home. This is the Louvre. This is their country cottage. Um, and that, I believe, is Fontainebleau. And all of these are very extensive, very well fortified. Um, they were all, they were smaller at the time that we're talking about because the Valois were succeeded by a bunch of egotists who loved conspicuous consumption. And there was only a single decade taken out of that starting from 1789. Of course, like any summer place, there had to be nature. And so the woods of Fontainebleau, which you can't quite see here, are lovely with lots of game for hunting, but they were easy to get lost in. Please keep that in mind, it becomes important. And this is Fontainebleau on the inside and you can see it's not too shabby. And here are the woods of Fontainebleau.
Well, Catherine Schickenson. Oh, I don't think we've covered quite how Francois actually died. We just killed him off. Actually, what happened was he got a really bad ear infection and he started to scream in pain. Nothing could be done. Um, he took to his bed. He was semi comatose. Everybody was begging um, Catherine to call in Ambroise Paré, who was a uh, battlefield doctor who had absolutely revolutionized the treatment of battlefield injuries so that they weren't a death sentence. And she absolutely refused. She sat by him. She wouldn't let anybody in. That was her privilege because she was his mother. But after a while, he started to scream. He lapsed into unconsciousness and he died. And she just sat on. Why? Because she had two other sons who could be king. And, you know, so who needed him? And besides, it would get rid of Mary, whom she instantly sent back to Scotland and the horrible rest of his life. So now we get to Charles the Ninth. He was king, and there was a palpable shift in the sentiment of the court away from the Guise. Ambroise was mostly responsible. 52 nobles had been beheaded, and that made a big difference. The new king was actually friends with uh, the Protestant leader, Admiral Coligny, as was his youngest brother, who had been. Uh, actually, uh, the younger brother, the youngest brother, assumed the deceased brother's name in order to honor him. So there's two Francoises, but at different times. Catherine had her hands full now that she was regent. She, um, and she didn't want a civil war at this point. Admiral, by the way, was a title of, of, an, of an administrative uh, position, and it had nothing to do with the sea except from getting, from getting money from it. Okay, so Mary is kicked out, and... Um, Queen Marie of Scotland had conveniently died so she could go back to her life there. And her half brother, the Earl of Moray was running the show there. He was a staunch Protestant and he didn't like taking orders from anybody, less, let alone a teenage girl. So Catherine was probably happy imagining and rightly so what happened to her. I always remember the Earl of Moray because that's Moray eel and the same word. And that was pretty much his temperament. Okay, so what did she do? She struck a deal with King Antoine of Navarre, who was one of the princes of the blood and acceptable for succession, which in return for Conde's release, he gave up his rights to the regency, um, which he would have been in once the princes of the blood were exhausted and there were enough of them, so that probably wouldn't happen. But um, as a, a Protestant, there would have been some problems. It was a savvy trade. Conde was his brother. Antoine's wife, Jeanne, who owned all the backbone of the family, was leader of the Protestant faction in Navarre. Antoine's main occupation was avoiding trouble. He had a teenage son named Henri who promised all kinds of trouble, but not yet. She surrounded herself with competent advisors and good advice. She gave the Huguenot limited freedom to worship beyond the borders of a town. 
and they were not allowed to sing those hymns outside. <laughs> if you step on a snake, it will turn and bite you. Francis de Guise chafed as his loss of power. At Vassy on March 1st, uh, 62, Huguenot gathered for worship in a church that was close, or maybe just inside, anyway, who surveyed at that time, the town which belonged to him. He brought his troops and killed 500 of them. The massacre set off the wars of religion in France. Huguenot uprisings broke out. Catholic reprisals killed tens of thousands and wiped out whole villages. Catherine signed an edict giving Huguenot freedom to practice their religion anywhere, as long as they didn't do it in public and frighten the horses as the saying goes. She shortly made a strong turn Catholic word in an effort to get Philip II of Spain dwarf psycho son, Don Carlos, not like the opera at all, betrothed to Margot. She reversed again when that fell through. Margot cried tears of joy. Foreign powers began to take notice of the Huguenot, now led by Condé. Queen Elizabeth of England and English volunteers, including Sir Walter Raleigh, uh, came to help the Huguenot and money for mercenaries. German princes sent 14,000 soldiers. The Huguenot army swelled to 30,000. In 1563, Le Balafre was assassinated just as he was poised to take Orléans from the Huguenot. The Admiral Coligny, leader of the Huguenot troops, was accused of hiring the hitman. Finally, a peace of, was signed in 70, and Margot got engaged, not to Don Carlos, but to the young and handsome Henri of Navarre. Yes, a man who really knew how to write a love letter. You can read them, all his girls' friends saved them. I hope they didn't compare notes because he copied one to another. It was not a smooth engagement. Catherine discovered that Margot was involved with Henri de Guise, Francis's son. She brought her upstairs to a room, beat her up and pulled out a lot of Margot's hair. Catherine has been accused of sleeping with Francois de Guise herself, but then she's been accused of everything since the fall of Rome. According to Margot's memoirs, mother and daughter had once been close and their intimacy had delighted lonely Margot. But one of Margot's brothers convinced their mother that Margot was spying on her. And according to Margot's memoirs, she was cut off really coldly without a word of explanation. It devastated her. And if I can get down, yes. Here is Jeanne de Navarre. And here is the wedding from the film. Jeanne, uh, we'll get back to her, of course, came to Paris for the wedding and she wanted to go shopping with her best friend, Catherine, now for a mother of, of the bride gown. And she wasn't in the best of health, according to Catherine, but there's no other evidence of that. One morning, she awoke with abdominal pains and fever and died some hours afterwards. Well, could that have been poison? You know, poisons are not that hard to make. Ricin can be made by any really, really careful amateur. And you make it from castor beans, which are not hard to get. And Catherine actually employed, it was said, a professional poisoner. The autopsy, which Catherine ordered, cleared her completely at least in Catholic minds, the Huguenot had other ideas. And you saw their wedding. And four days later, a sniper wounded Admiral Coligny. 
The Guises had publicly accused him of complicity in La Balafre's assassination. King Charles visited his friend, the Admiral, who was resting in a sickbed. The next night, a Protestant delegation, oops, a Catholic delegation broke into the court and demanded justice. The Protestant, they wanted their justice. On August 24th, the battle, of the bells for matins, which is the morning prayer, everybody knew, rang out at midnight. Henri of Guise, with members of his clan, broke into Coligny's house, killed him, and threw him out the window into the street. The bells had been a signal. The Catholic population took up every sharp or blunt instrument they could find and swarmed into the streets and started to kill Huguenot. The St. Bartholomew's Day massacre had begun. Where was everybody that night? King Charles was older, Catherine was no longer regent, and it took her an hour's long harangue to get him to consent to the massacre. Coligny had been his friend, but the Protestant invasion of the court had frightened him, he wasn't brave. Henri, now King of Navarre, was agreeably passing the night with Madame de Sauve, the star of Catherine's Esquadron Volant, the flying squadron, Volant. A group of pretty women who spied on their multiple and frequent bedmates for her. The couple was disturbed by Margot pounding on their door. She had come to save her husband's life. Margot, uncharacteristically alone in her bed, had wakened to the sounds of violence and a storm of knocking on her door. She opened it to a bleeding man begging for shelter. Horrified, she let him stay and went out into the palace halls, echoing with screams to find Henri. He and his juvenile companions returned with her to fragile safety in her room. The sounds of mayhem died away at dawn, but the massacre continued beyond the palace walls. In Paris, 3,000 Huguenots were killed. Over 70,000, although estimates vary depending on your point of view, throughout France. The wars of religion that had simmered, by the way, I should point out in this picture, of, although it probably wasn't there, here is Catherine overseeing the whole thing. Um, the wars of religion that had simmered. Uh, Jane, yeah. uh, I have a question. I think it's so. Who do you think? Uh, where do you put the blame for this to happen? I mean, uh, specifically, because a lot of people blame Catherine. Well, I certainly would go along with that. I mean, she needed power. The Guises were powerful, even though Mary had been sent back to Scotland. Uh, Charles was still malleable. Uh, and the Huguenots were a threat to her. Huguenots were more and more popular among nobles, people who had a possibility of taking over the throne. She really needed them to get gone. And you know, there was, it was kind of, there was kind of a war on at the time anyway, although it was small compared to what happened. Okay, getting back, um, this will come quite later, this slide. Um, okay. Where was everybody that night? King Charles was 20, was older, Catherine was no longer regent, and it took her a long time to get him to consent. And we rescued Henri, or at least Margot did. And the guy who invaded her bedroom was his, um, 
de la Mole and uh, he pretty much told her what was going on. He later replaced, or almost immediately, but not that night, obviously, replaced Henri de Guise and supplemented Henri de Navarre in his occasional appearances in her bed. Grateful for survival, he risked his life to act as liaison for the three, three prisoners with the Huguenot outside the walls. Because once this had happened, Margot and Henry um, and Francois as well were locked down inside by Catherine. They couldn't get out. So Henri was making plans for escape and uh, Francois was terrified that he'd be implicated. So he spilled the beans to Catherine and named everybody involved, including de la Mole, the one who had asked Margot for help. And he was condemned to death. Margot spent his last night with him in his prison cell, unless you think anything improper went on, his legs and arms had been broken during his inquisition. After his execution, she took possession of his head. Uh, the plot of Stendhal's The Red and the Black builds on the De La Mole affair. Two months later, Charles IX died. I wonder if he had any regrets or fears of hell. He was succeeded by his flamboyant brother, Henri, who is now the third of that name, who had just resigned from being king of Poland, where he'd been borrowed by the Polish to take over the regency. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> to take over being king. And their alternative had been Ivan Groszny, Ivan the Terrible, so he didn't seem so bad, I guess. Um, and Henri, King of Navarre, apparently resigned to his captivity, became great friends with Henri de Balbois, even attending mass with him from time to time. He enjoyed de Sol's company. After a while, it seemed to Henri, oh, they didn't show Madame de Sol, here she is. Look at that, looking sly. Um, it seemed to Henri King, a shame to keep his good friend from his favorite exercise, second favorite. And so they went out hunting in those extensive woods I showed you by Fontainebleau. Good game, big mistake. A group of you, you know, were waiting with an extra swift horse, Henri Bourbon, that is the Navarre, somehow separated from the others and he just happened to find them and hightailed it with him for freedom and Navarre. Margot's mother could find her abandoned daughter in her room and interdicted her correspondence. She spent months except for letters. She paid the servants to smuggle in and out for her incommunicado. As for Francois, he knew his life was in danger. Henri III was murderously vindictive and unpredictable. Francois absconded and raised an army for the politique, a party mostly Huguenot, but also contained some moderate Catholics who were totally sick of this business, which profited mostly the de Guises, and 10,000 German missionaries were bought by Elizabeth I, whom he was courting. And so he took on the forces of the crown and he won. The crown was broke. Henri III couldn't pay his troisième, could not pay his soldiers and the word was getting out. Militant Catholics supported the crown still, but the Catholic League led by the Guises uh, the moderates just wanted peace or the politiques. Catherine, now so fat that the Huguenot named their largest canon the Queen Mother, preferring deceit to total surrender, negotiated the peace of Monsieur. Monsieur was the name given to the second in line for the, uh, to be King of France. 
which granted the Yugno almost total freedom of religion, no singing hymns outside in public places, and Margot's release from room arrest. Catherine went back on the freedom of religion part as soon as Francois' army was disbanded. Francois shaped his treatment at court, which was mostly contemptuous after his military success ended in anticlimax. And he reconverted to Catholicism. He craved glory and thought it could be found in the Netherlands where the population, including many Catholics, was hardy, tired of Spain's oppression and would welcome a French uh, regime, even if it meant um, putting up with French troubles. The grass is always greener and France wouldn't mind a territorial expansion, but the two. So here we have now the situation in the Netherlands. And here we have Philip riding on the cow and having it milked by one of his ministers. And here is Elizabeth feeding it. And here it is defecating on Francois. So I'll leave you with that for a second. Uh, oh yes, this is the Prince of Orange and he is holding the horns of the Netherlands, trying desperately to keep it steady. And uh, uh, Elizabeth is an, another daughter of Catherine de Medici, right? No, 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 no. no? This Elizabeth is uh, the Elizabeth we know and love from uh, Good Queen Bess. Oh, oh, that's the English Elizabeth? Yes, the English Elizabeth. Yeah. She was Protestant, of course. So she was uh, involved in sending Protestant armies to cripple any um, right. competitor of uh, England. But Philip II, that... Philip II also married Elizabeth, daughter of Catherine the marriage, right? Uh, was it Philip? Yes, it was his yes. wife. That's why I got confused. So yeah. they were on the opposite they, side. She was in the, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was Elizabeth. And uh, Don Carlos was in love with, yes, 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 like the opera. <laughs> okay. Um, but he was running the place. And so let's see what we can do about this. Here's the cartoon. And as for Margaret's new freedom, it was limited to the palace walls. Now that Dussault was no longer available, Henri, who had escaped, had begun to miss his wife, or at least his letters said so. And no doubt the servants Margot bribed to smuggle his letters to her were showing them to Catherine for more bribes. Catherine would not let her go to Navarre, the country of which she was now queen. Fortunately, the princess, De La Roche-Soyon was planning to visit Flanders, now in part Belgium, to take the waters. A delightful routine of garden strolls, dances, and long evenings in congenial company, along with, of course, you had to drink the waters for your health. Even more fortunately, Margot's doctor had decided that this is exactly what she needed for a rash that marred the beautiful ivory roundness of her arm and which she'd gone to all the trouble of inducing. Belgium is in the exact opposite direction from Navarre and she would be surrounded by the ladies of the court. Let her amuse herself, Catherine said. What could go wrong? And to make absolutely sure that nothing would, Henri III persuaded Don Juan of Austria, the illegitimate half-brother of King Philip of Spain and commander of Spanish forces in the Netherlands to keep an eye on his sister's doing there and imprison her if necessary. Blithely unaware, Margot set off for Flanders, but not to amuse herself. She was on a mission. Francois had charged her with discovering what support against Spain he might find among the nobles of Flanders, and what castles, towns, etc., 
could be used as military bases. Margot rose to the task. She charmed her Flemish hosts into dangerous revelations of where their sympathies lay and what they might do if they got called on to support a French invasion. On her last night, Don Juan's men swooped down on all the places where she stayed and extracted from her hosts rather painfully descriptions of what had transpired. I hope they survived. Margot was at Spa, and this is the meters long um, painting at Spa, which shows all the royal people who have ever been there, and it is quite a collection. She got a letter there from Francois warning her that Don Juan was on her trail, about to intercept and capture her. When she began preparing to escape, her treasurer told her there was no money to pay her bill. And so her horses had been sequestered by the owner of her building. It was a lie. Uh, King Henri III had planted the treasurer among her entourage to spy on. Well, the Princess de la roche sur uh, lent her the necessary funds and horses as well. But even after Margot and her train galloped away from Spa, the little group was still in danger. In the town of Hui, where they had gone for shelter, the town council, terrified of Don Juan, closed the gates to trap them. When Don Juan didn't appear during the night, the town started having second thoughts about what would happen to them if they kidnapped the queen and let her go. When the fugitive stopped at Dinan, an envoy from Don Juan arrived at the town walls and announced that his, arrived, his armed company would be pleased to escort Margot to Namur, where she would be Don Juan's honored guest. Margot knew exactly what that meant, and she was having absolutely none of it. Assigning the Cardinal of Lenincourt, one of her companions, to chat with the envoy and distract him, she excused herself to pack for the journey, but instead she persuaded her host to let her hear mass and take some refreshment for the journey. Naturally, the captain, so the town let in the captain and only the captain um, while she was doing these things. And naturally he wanted to accompany her on these really innocent pursuits. But as they walked, she and he and her companions were gradually surrounded by a hundred friendly but well-armed civilians. They chatted amiably enough as they progressed, though all the while was, the captain was trying to tell them they were heading to the river, not to the gate where the church was. At the river, someone had left some boats. The Spanish soldiers were still outside the gates on the other side of town. Margot and her companions gave up all pretense and scampered for their lives, rode like Olympic racers across the Meuse. Meanwhile, the townspeople uh, warned the Spaniards would the next welcome would involve artillery fire. Well, we'll only hit the highlights of very few of the next few years. I've already omitted a lot of great Margot stories that you'll have to read for yourself. She joined Henri of Nav in Navarre. He got over to Sors by falling in love with several other women, all of whom he's War, eternal fidelity, promising to kiss their hands a million times. Oh, <laughs> why doesn't anybody do this for me when they met? Which was seldom because there were so many of them. Besides, he was busy fighting religious war. The last straw for Margot was the attachment to a young lady, Marie de Bruyne, popularly known, but not to her face, as La Belle Fosseuse, which means ditch not the other, who eventually suffered the usual results of dalliance. 
at the Parisian court, of course, mistresses flaunted both their affairs and the consequences of, but Protestant Navarre was very conservative. So Henri dispatched Margot, who'd never even birthed a child, despite her history, to assist with the delivery. The child died conveniently within an hour of her birth. Henri spent most of his time trying to conquer Catholic cities, mostly unsuccessfully, except for the industrial center of Cahors, which had been promised as part of Margot's dowry all those many years ago. Chico the Jester, another great novel by Alexandre Dumas, contains a wonderful, though possibly apocryphal, passage regarding this episode. Henri knows that Chico, who is his house guest, was sent to spy on him by Catherine. He's unwilling to let Chico out of his sight for obvious reasons, and so he invites him to come with him on a hunt. So gradually, as she goes in the hunting party, groups of men join the hunt, a few at first and then by hundreds, while Henri explains to Chico that they are wearing armor because they don't want to ruin their clothes in the woods. When the last group to join them brings artillery, he remarks that he had given their town those guns and they are so proud of them, they drag them everywhere. And when they reach the walls of Cahors and set explosives under them, Henri, his white plume, waving in the breeze we got there by some miracle, is the first into the breach. Now, if people want to have a minute or two to talk, otherwise I'll go on. Dumas, by the way, was concerned that French people were losing the collective memory of their history. And as he wrote, and so he wrote this dangerously addictive novels to teach it to them. And here's what happened to the cast of characters. Francois died sick and disillusioned, whether from a broken heart when Elizabeth finally rejected him, or maybe the Valois. Males like Henry VIII's descendant, male descendants were not destined for long life. Um, his death left the Huguenot Henri of Navarre, the heir presumptive. Henri endorsed him and allied with him. The Guises in their newly researched Catholic League were energized against the court to make peace with them or by time. Catherine made a treaty with the League that rescinded religious freedom to France and thus disqualified Henri with, from the succession. King Henri had no intention of letting power slip into the hands of Catherine and the Guises. To cut off the head of the snake, he had his guardsmen assassinate Henri de Guise, as well as his brother, the Cardinal of Lorraine. They were the head and heart of the Catholic League, and it subsided in disarray. 13 days later, Catherine de' Medici died. Just as the assassination of Francois de Guise was used to bring about the massacre of St. Bartholomew's Day, the assassination of Henri de Guise spurred a mentally unbalanced monk, Jacques Clément, to beg an audience with Henri III eight months later. His wish granted, he disemboweled the king with a knife stab in the belly. Henri III died of infection a few days later, naming his friend and legitimate heir, Henri of Navarre, to succeed him as King Henri IV. And the civil war resumed all over France. The Guises took over Paris and named the Cardinal de Bourbon uh, as king. Margot joined the Catholic League captured the town of Algen and fortified it against her husband. But she neglected to fortify it against the citizens who threw her out. She took refuge in a nearby castle, but it was surrounded by her husband's forces who imprisoned her therein. He also delegated one Jacques Dobiac to keep an eye on her and then rode away. 
It didn't take long for Dobiak to switch allegiance. He died violently like all of Margot's lovers executed for help to escape. Henri, bowing to necessity, converted to the Catholic faith. And here is his abjugation, abjugation, I guess. And he became the King of France. Freed at last from war, Henri fell at love, really deeply. Gabriel d'Estre had already borne him three children when Henri applied to the Pope for the annulment of his marriage with Margot in preparation with the wedding for Gabriel. Despite everything, Henri had no ill will towards Margot and he gave her a generous pension and a place to live, although she was forbidden to come to Paris. He gave Gabriel a coronation ring. She died suddenly the morning of their wedding day. Some say it was a miscarriage. Henri was prostrate with grief, but he needed to have an heir. He married Marie de Medici a year later. And here is, come on, come on. Ah, yes. Here is Gabriel Destre. And here is Marie de Medici. Marie became great friends with Margot after Henri allowed Margot to come back to Paris. Henri was assassinated, the last of her lovers to die by violence. The wars of religion were over, ended by this piece of paper, the Edict of Navarre, of Nantes. The edict upheld Protestant in freedom of conscience and permitted them to hold public worship in many parts of the kingdom, though not in Paris. It granted them full civil rights, including access to education and established a special court, the Chambre de l'Edi, composed of both Protestants and Catholics to deal with their disputes. Protestant pastors were to be paid by the state and released from certain obligations. The Protestant could keep the strongholds they were holding in 1597 as place de sûreté for eight following years. The expense of garrisoning them was to be paid for by the king. Extension of Protestant worship was legally impossible. The edict was limited by Richelieu and finally by revolt by Louis XIV. The French did not have actual legal freedom of religion until 1905. Margot, now leading a life of piety and intellectual endeavor, wrote her memoirs and died peaceably in 1615. And there's Henri whom we honor. And that is it. Okay, so uh, let's see if anybody has questions. Uh, you could put them in chat, I guess. Uh, just Jane, just wanted. I have a question. Sorry, quickly. Oh. Um, so the, the Medici family, interestingly enough, uh, apparently what I heard is after the Jews um, that uh, after the Inquisition, they were thrown out of Spain and Portugal. A lot of them went to papal states or papacy states, and therefore they were involved in banking. Um, and they said the Medici family, you know, maybe not directly, but inherited uh, the banking 
I guess, skills and, you know, um, and abilities from Jews. Even the fact that um, the first time it was invented where a person was sitting behind a desk uh, was something that was invented by, you know, uh, you know the Medici following, looking at how Jews did it. And they were, therefore, they were involved in, the reason the Jews were involved in banking, right? We know about Rothschilds and all this famous bank, uh, banks is because uh, in the in the Bible it's I guess or whatever it's frowned upon to lend uh, and collect the interest and therefore so do you have you heard anything like that before? Uh, yes, I have I certainly heard it. It's disputed. Um, some of it may be uh, the fact that bankers are generally hated because, you know, they collect loans and things like that. And of course, Jews, um, well, we don't have to go into that. So calling bankers Jews or Jewish bankers is part of that may or may not be true. I certainly don't have the ultimate thing on that. I understand. I'm just, uh, just the fact that, um, it was, uh, you know, as a Jewish person, I am, I was just interested in the Domenici having built their empire. And initially they were banks, um, you know, maybe they had something to do with it. But if anybody else, any other questions, I'll unmute everybody. And then if you have a question, uh, just be respectful and then ask yourself your question. You know, I just wanted to add that uh, 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 one thing that Henry IV was basically the founder of the Bourbon dynasty. I mean, there was uh, his predecessor, Henry III, when he was assassinated, the Valois dynasty has ended and, and the Bourbon dynasty started. So that's kind of part of it. And as far as the edict, uh, edict of Nantes, um, uh, the one that you were talking about, uh, uh, unfortunately, it didn't last for more than 100 years. Okay. Uh, I think uh, the, uh, the son... Uh, uh, well, uh, Henry the Fourth and uh, Mary Medici's son is famous Louis the Thirteen. Those who read the, uh, uh, you know, Three Musketeers, you know, this mm -hmm. is those times. And uh, and uh, Louis the Fourteenth, the grandson, revoked uh, the Edict of Nantes. Yes, Richelieu had done so before, or limited some before, but they couldn't wait to get back to oh. the old ways. Okay, let's see uh, if anyone have uh, any questions uh, or you could either speak or uh, unmute yourself or put it in the chat. Uh, well, uh, well, Greg, I, um, just to pick up on what Zach was saying, I don't know any definitive answers uh, relative to the de Medici's, but... Um, <clears throat> That whole um, biblical restriction on um, what is now often called usury, didn't that lead a lot to the confluence of the church and various rulers and various explorers um, develop this kind of shareholding and profit model for um, exploiting and empire building in the uh, rest of the world? In other words, it gave, it gave the, the church and the, um, the Christian, whatever, uh, population an opportunity to um, make money doing this without directly lending it. They formed kind of corporations that then allowed them to profit so they weren't profiting directly off money forwarded or money fronted. Does anybody yes. have a Yes, well, um, always when the nobility wants to do something that um, they are prohibited from doing, they always find somebody to do it for them. So I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. Well, and that model remained, um, like in the United States particularly, that was the basis for the whole capitalist system that grew out of that. Well, I guess so. Um, certainly, uh, the banks have been accused of running the government here, too. 
Yes, thank you. Yeah, the Christians prior to that, uh, uh, specifically Templars, they kind of uh, found a, a loophole uh, how to profit from uh, uh, making loans. Uh, specifically, uh, you could uh, uh, deposit money at, in one city to the uh, uh, Templar temple, uh, t- Templars uh, and pay a fee. And then uh, later on, you could, uh, with a note that they gave you, could uh, retrieve your money somewhere else where there is uh, where they held branches. Uh, so it was safe to tra- because otherwise it was very unsafe to travel. And I'm talking about the time of Crusades um, uh, for, from there on. Uh, for a, so that it was another form in a way they they they, were, they didn't charge the percentage; they just charged the fee for you know, this transfer, and, and that was supposedly, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, allowed. And that, that, I think that evolved kind of into the um, exploration companies or the what, expeditionary companies, I guess, in the colonies and so, so forth. It was kind of an early idea of a corporation. Uh, yeah, but certainly this period is uh, very bloody. These religious wars, as usual, especially in France, uh, with all these opponents and uh, this crescendo in the San, San Bartolomeo night. Uh, you know, that's uh, you know that's basically uh, was very important part of the politics uh, at the time uh, in the 16th century and the and 17th century. Yeah, the early settlers in New England had a very strong Calvinist influence. So, th- yeah, that part was interesting as well. Yeah, um, the, Bur- the Bourbons were Calvinists. I, I mean, um, I'm talking about the Navarre uh, and Henry IV himself uh, was a uh, Calvinist. Uh, he uh, clearly, uh, uh, you know, went into, uh, became Catholic and converted this way, then the way back, then again. I mean, he was a, a political opportunist, uh, clearly. <laughs> yeah. Well, with New England, I think, um, yeah, it, it, that Puritanism, I think, is, and it, that has remained, I think, a strong uh, streak in, in a certain segment of, um, of uh, American culture. It's, it's a, I think, a minority, but there's definitely that, because um, there's that fundamentalist element about Calvinism that crops up regularly in, in um, U.S. culture. Yeah, a lot of Guggenauts had to were forced to immigrate. Uh, <laughs> that's what usually happens during the war, and uh, a big chunk of them ended up in South Africa. That's uh, that's by the way the origin of South African wine. <laughs> and I live two blocks away from a Huguenot Street, and if you go up to um, where is it up along the Hudson? where the colleges, uh, they have old stone houses that were an original Huguenot uh, colony. Uh-huh. Uh, is it, uh, uh, what, what, what uh, are you talking about, uh, uh, up, uh, uptown or, or? No, no, up, upstate, I've got. <laughs> upstate, I see. <laughs> yeah, the one right by the, the bridge over. I mean, there are a bunch oh, of them. Oh, uh, Tappan Z? Uh, no, up beyond that. Um, and. It's the it's the town, I think, north of Rosendale, where the college is. Mm, okay. New Paltz. A uh, New Paltz, yeah. Okay. Yes. Oh, Vicky's asking if I think that's what we've been discussing. Vicky is that things that are prohibited, we have a tendency to, or any strong institution and nobles and churches would have been that we're able to constantly devise ways around that whole idea of usury. Um, it's not that money lending is prohibited, it's making money off of lending yeah, money. Interest. That's I think. But how did Medici uh, circumvent that? That's what yeah. that the original question was. Yeah. That I cannot tell you. I probably should have done some research in it, but I have no idea. 
I was just curious because I know they like lent a lot like different families and like the Pope and stuff owed the money and things and I didn't know whether it was just they lent it and then called in favours a search for it rather than money or kind of interest on it instead I'm sure favors were part of it. I have no yeah. doubt. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. They were the main. The main, they were the major clients of uh, Medici's, uh, the papal states, uh, uh, de definitely. And that uh, was always a question of if they would default, the Medici would go down, uh, and that's why Medici had such an influence that eventually. Uh, you know, first uh, son of uh, Lorenzo, the magnificent Giovanni, uh, became uh, a pope, uh, Leo X, and then his cousin, uh, you know, um, became a pope of Clement the uh, Seventh. Uh, <laughs> they had such an influence with the church. It's all about money and indulgences themselves. That was a money-making scheme, right? That's how the coffers were replenished, as you pointed out, Jane. Um, yes. It's not, you're not making money off of money, but you're getting people to give you money for basically no value. So, you know, that should probably be kind of prohibited by religious doctrine as well. Well, don't I think forget, Martin Luther agreed with. <laughs> don't forget that the people who bought the indulgence had great confidence that they would go directly to heaven. And if you really do believe in heaven and you really believe in hell, the idea that you'll go to heaven is very, very comforting. And honestly, if I could have that assurance um, when I go, despite my life, um, I would be very happy about it. Yeah, and it kind of requires believing very much in a de' Medici Pope, though, to actually think you're buying an indulgence. <laughs> so it, it was a scheme. And that was the whole point of, uh, that was one of Luther's major points, actually, I think. Yeah, that's right. That's excellent. Um, again, really appreciate this was a really amazing discussion. Thank you so much, Jane. And uh, thanks for inviting uh, your friends as well. And thanks for everybody to joining today. Let me just go over some of the schedule that we have, unless anybody has any more questions. Um, so we kind of like uh, slowing down a little bit in April, but in May, we're going to pick it back up. Um, the reason being is, you know, our main so to speak, speaker on Thursdays, Richard is going to be uh, taking hiatus for a couple of weeks. Uh, but let me just go over the schedule that we have. And again, this might um, coincide with some of the in-person events we're going to have, but let's just, uh, let me just go through. So uh, for instance, um, uh, on the 24th, we're doing intro to Europe, which is we're going to do part two of European defense system. Uh, which is Richard and Aaron. Um, on Saturday, April 30th, um, a friend of mine that I introduced um, to the publisher had wrote a book on uh, the London Revolution. He's a part of our group. His name is Michael, and he's going to be premiering his book or presenting his book. So do join. Very, It's going to be really interesting. He's going to talk about 40 minutes about his book and the rest is going to be more Q&A questions. Then... Um, you know, we'll see if this is going to be postponed, but um, uh, we're going to have actually Life of a Roman Soldier reenactment presentation. It will be in person, but uh, it will be probably right next to Cloisters Museum in May. And then we will, what we'll try is we'll probably have a live stream and uh, people can ask questions and somebody could, you know, we'll see how it's organized, but we'll live stream it. The May 5th, we'll have in the shadow of Nader Shah, Nader Shah um, uh, Hatakis uh, Afsharidis and Zans, which is a Persia, ancient Persia, I mean, medieval Persia. And actually, we're going to come back to our Ukrainian conflict, historical understanding of the conflict and talking about Mont Bonner, uh, what's happening with it. That's going to be in May 8th. Um, and um, this other really great events is uh, Qajar dynasty on May 12th, Persia. We're going to talk about rise of the Qing dynasty in warring states, period, and September, May 14th. Um, May 21st, uh, uh, Beverly is going to present Latin language and literature in ancient Rome. So do join that one. And then um, we'll close up 
our May presentations with uh, the gift of light, uh, Manishan the theology and scripture of Gnosis, um, which Rich is actually looking right now for a uh, co-partner. Um, and we'll see if Edward can help us out. Maybe we'll move that one. But um, we also will repeat a 100-year war, but it's going to be more, not armor as armor, it's going to be more on politics, politics of the war uh, particularly. And it's going to be presented by my friend Andrew uh, in June. So do stay tuned. I'll add more program as they come. Uh, whoever wants to step up and present, let me know. Uh, we can coordinate with me and Richard, Greg, and then we can even help you with uh, presentation. But it's like what Jane did today was amazing. And that's her third presentation in our group. Hope to do more. She, she may do more, especially on powerful women. Uh, you know, Catherine the Great, you know, uh, Elizabeth, Mary, you know, all those great women. Um, or, you know, or even go on ancient one like Olympia and uh, Cleopatra, Nefertiti. You know, I'm looking for somebody who maybe would be interested to do a powerful women presentation. So without further ado, I want to wish everybody a nice weekend and uh, see you when I see you. Jane, th thank you for fabulous presentation. Yes. What did you say yes. of your book that was going to be done the 30th? What was the name of that book? Oh, it's uh, English Revolution. Oh, I mean. Uh, yeah. It's, that's the name uh, of it? Yeah, that's, well, I actually posted it on the uh, meetup, but um, the actual name, let me just go back to that in a second. Um, I'm sorry, it's the Ro London Revolution, 1640 to 1643. And it says the classical struggles in 17th century of England. And uh, it's going to be presented by a friend of mine who wrote this book. His name is Michael Sturza. All right. Thank you so much. I didn't uh, get to write it down when the first time you mentioned it. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right. Have a nice weekend, everybody. Thank you, Jane, again. It was an incredible presentation. Thank yes, you. Thank you, Jane. Blessings. Bye, okay. and all. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Bye.